Uh, welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, wherever you are. Um, I can see we have quite a large international audience on YouTube, so welcome people in uh, Washington, um, Oklahoma, Virginia, Delaware, Lancashire, Rutland, not in USA. So I hope you enjoy tonight. And this is what we've got coming up. Um, I have a, a few short slides uh, just to um, go over a few things for society members and what's coming up next. And then we'll have the main event of the evening, which is exploring the visible cosmos through Ireland universes from Dr. Jennifer Millard. So thank you, Jennifer, for coming to do that for us. Yeah, no, of course. Happy to. Um, lots of ways of staying in touch with us um, through our website, through Facebook, Twitter, probably Mastodon quite soon, actually, has to be said. Um, YouTube, a lot of our meetings for the past few years are on our YouTube channel and some great talks there. And this talk will be on afterwards as well, if you want to catch up with it again. And um, our Flickr group um, for all the images that our members are taking at the moment. And there are some amazing images on there. So have a look at that as well. Um, I've mentioned this at previous meetings, but we have a firm date for our telescope help shop. So this is aimed at beginners who maybe have got a new telescope or had one sitting in the cupboard for a while and um, don't know how to use it. Um, we've This is our fifth one. It's been very popular. Places are limited so we can give sort of one-to-one -one support. Um, there are now 10 spaces remaining for um, non-members to join if they want to. Um, you'll find the tickets on Eventbrite and you'll find links to that on our website as well. It is part of our Four Steps programme, uh, helping people to get into astronomy. Um, and um, you'll find more information about that on our website as well. Um, it's, it's quite a lot of good resources on there if you're interested in starting out in astronomy. Um, just a, a quick note about the Geminid meteor shower that's been happening recently. I don't know if you've been um, going outside at night, but you, you can't have failed to notice that the meteors have been happening every few minutes. There have been loads of them. And, and um, we have four, uh, five now meteor cameras by members in, in the society, and they've been capturing. Um, this is a stack of a night's images um, of meteor captures, and is really rather amazing the number we've had this year. It's been a great, a great shower. Um, if you want to see what uh, meteor cameras are capturing, you can see the daily feeds of them on our website under um, the Edinburgh Meteor Cameras page as well. But it's it's great fun just just following them and seeing what's happening. Uh, these are the talks that are coming up. So this is our last talk for 2022. And um, the next one will be on the 6th of January when Rhea Urban, one of our members and a space journalist, will be um, talking about claiming the sky back, about the challenge of the satellite mega, mega constellations. That's be a hybrid meeting, so you can join us um, at the Augustine United Church in Edinburgh or um, online as well. All our meetings are, are always broadcast online and visitors are always welcome. On the 11th of January, we have our Imaging Observing Group. That's for members only, and that's where we all share our images together and learn from each other, sharing tips and techniques and so on. 20th of January, an online-only talk about um, astronomy data sonification, turning images into sound, and that's from Clara Brasseur of St. Andrews University. On the 3rd of February, using computer simulations to model the formations of stars and their disks from Dr. James Worcester. Um, 17th of February, Emily Levesque will tell us about the last stargazers. That's about um, the lives of astronomers, really, what, what it is to be a, a professional astronomer. And on the 3rd of March, the life of a planetary system from Dr. Thomas Wilson. And that will be a, a hybrid meeting as well. Um, we've got um, two, two um, talks a month throughout the year, and we've got lots more lined up, but that's what's coming up next. Um, that's it from me. So um, right now I'm going to hand over to, to, to Jennifer and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Right. I'll just share my screen a second. Where is it? Doki. Okay. So hopefully we will be on slides and I'm just going to make this small and drop it down the bottom okay so uh hopefully you can hear me am i ready to go yeah yep ready to go thank you right excellent okay 
Yes, so um, thanks all for coming um, to this virtual talk. I'm very grateful for all of you who are going to be listening tonight. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a Cardiff University alumna, uh, so I did my undergraduate degree there and my postgraduate degree, so my PhD. So I completed that in 2021 and it was all about the stuff between the stars. So how the gas and the dust in galaxies evolves over cosmic time in the real and in the simulated universe. And I had a lot of fun on my PhD. You know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't, you know, it was a lot of stress, especially trying to finish during COVID, which officially makes me a plague doctor, which is just like one of the best things. But when I was doing my PhD, I realized that my true passion is actually talking about science. So the science that I was doing and also the science that other people were doing and just generally sharing my love of astronomy and space exploration with the world. So now I am the managing editor for a stargazing app uh, called Sky Guide, which is part of Fifth Star Labs, which is available to download free on the Apple App Store. So there we are. That's my official advertisement for that. And um, I also I do all sorts of stuff. So I lecture at Cardiff University. Um, I'm a BBC space expert. So yeah, I do the news and I do the radio and I'm a presenter for BBC One Wales's Weatherman Walking. I have a podcast, which is called Awesome Astronomy. So, you know, if you like this talk, maybe, maybe consider tuning into that as well. But aside from all the crazy space stuff that I do, um, I like to cross stitch. That's one of my hobbies. Um, and I'm owned by a cat called Oreo. She may or may not make an appearance. She's currently sat right behind me. So that's me. That's who I am. And the goal of today's talk is we're going to go through a history of galaxies and infrared astronomy. We're going to talk about different galaxy types, their main components. And I hope that the big takeaway from this talk is that you realise how important it is to study the universe using different types of light, not just the light that we can see with our eyes. So it's always nice to begin right at the beginning. And I thought we might talk about the origin of the word galaxy. Where does it come from? So it comes from a Greek word, galaxias, which means milky. And it is, of course, referring to that beautiful spill of light that we see going across the night sky. If you've ever been lucky enough to be under truly dark skies, away from light pollution, we've all seen that band, that concentration of light across the sky, you know, if we've been able to be under dark skies. That's what the word milk, the milky, the galaxious galaxy is referring to. And there is a wonderful Greek myth to go along with this. And it involves Zeus, because of course it involves Zeus, because it's, you know, say ancient Greek mythology, very little of it didn't involve Zeus. And Zeus, um, he liked the ladies. I think that's probably the most polite way to, to put it. And uh, one evening he was feeling quite amorous and so he went down to earth he found a, a beautiful lady had a night of passion and the result of that night of passion was hercules and zeus wanted to imbue hercules with the powers of a god and so in order to do that he took him up to mount olympus and he decided that the best way to do it would be to get his wife hera to breastfeed him in doing so, imbuing him the powers of a god. But Zeus being Zeus just did what Zeus wanted to do, didn't think about maybe asking Hera if this was this would be okay. No, of course not. Uh, Hera was asleep and he just put the babe on the breast. And then naturally Hera woke up and was like, Zeus, what is what is this? Who is this child? What's going on? Pushed Hercules away and in doing so, sprayed her breast milk across the sky, thus making the Milky Way. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting little bit of mythology to begin with. But in terms of actual observations of galaxies and considering the universe, extragalactic astronomy, the first written observation of what we know today to be an extragalactic object actually dates, surprisingly, all the way back to the 10th century with Persian astronomer Al-Sufi. And in his book of fixed stars, which I've got a picture of on the right, uh, this is Ursa Major from his book of fixed stars, which is one of the earliest collections of constellations and thoughts about the night sky that we ha we have uh, remaining mm -hmm. to us. Release, there we go. Uh, he recorded the Andromeda galaxy, 
as a small cloud. And again, if you've ever been under dark skies, you may have been fortunate enough to pick out the Andromeda galaxy as a faint fuzzy blob. But the problem is, galaxies remained as faint fuzzy blobs for a very, very long time. It was actually only a hundred years ago that we realized the true nature of galaxies, of what these fuzzy blobs were, that there was anything beyond our Milky Way. Isn't that astonishing? It's only been a hundred years. Because up until then, our Milky Way, our galaxy, was the entire universe. And today we know of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of galaxies out there, billions of galaxies. So how do we get to studies like that? Let's find out. So the good place to start with this, I think, is telescopes. Because with the naked eye, all we can see are fuzzy blobs. We really need to begin at the age of sort of true science with astronomy. Now, the invention of the telescope is typically associated with Galileo Galilei, right? You know, that that's kind of who it is. Some of you may be sitting in the audience thinking, ha-ha, what about the Dutch eyeglass makers? Well, what indeed about the Dutch eyeglass makers? We will come on to them. But I would argue that the telescope may well have been invented by this guy, Leonard Diggs. Now, he was an Oxford-educated mathematician and surveyor in the 16th century, and he invented a surveying tool to aid him in his work called a thedolite. I've got a picture of a thedolite on the screen here. And the purpose of the thedolite was to provide some magnification. It enabled him to make more accurate distance measurements and angle measurements and so on. Now, I don't know about you, but if you look at that fed light, which is of the time of Diggs, that kind of looks like a little telescope to me. You know, very much so. And he may well have actually invented a rudimentary telescope with this magnifying tool. Now, whether Leonard Diggs used his magnifying tool and turned it to the heavens is an open question. But his son, Thomas, is quite a different story. Now, Leonard Diggs um, was, at, was interested in astronomy um, because he provided the first English translation of the Copernican model of the universe. So that is the sun-centered model of the universe. And you know, prior to that, the Earth was the center of the universe. And it's around Leonard's time where this theory is only just starting to gain tract. And Leonard published his English translation in a book called Prognostication Everlasting. A few years after it was published, Thomas Diggs did an update. And in this updated version, we find some very interesting notes. Because here, this is the first time that we find written observation of someone postulating that the universe extends to infinity. Stars extend to infinity. And this is completely different to the idea of fixed stars that Copernicus wrote about in his model. So there is some thinking that the fact that Thomas Diggs in this update to the, the translation of the Copernican model of the universe wrote about infinite stars and an infinite universe, that he might have taken his father's magnifying tool and actually turned it to the night sky and resolved it into seemingly innumerable suns. Just like we know, someone else eventually did. Now, we cannot, you know, overlook Galileo's contributions to telescopes and astronomy because we know that Dutch eyeglass makers did make a magnifying tool. Galileo never received one of these tools. He just received a description of them. And from that, he built what would become a telescope. And we know that undoubtedly he used it to study the night sky. And we know as well that he did resolve the milky band of our galaxy into an apparently infinite array of stars. And this is where we really start thinking about the universe, our galaxy, because at this stage they are one and the same in a very scientific way. Now, the problem with the invention of the telescope is that suddenly we could see a lot more, right? 
And for a very long time, it was a case of almost like collecting postage stamps or Pokemon. It was like, yeah, that's a new thing. That's a new thing. What's this? What's that? Oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. And so for a very long time, astronomy was was kind of collecting, um, being overwhelmed by information, some thinking going on, of course, you know, we know that. But in terms of thinking about the universe as a whole and thinking about our galaxy, we have to actually jump all the way till the middle of the 18th century before we even start finding coherent thoughts about the universe. And we go to English astronomer Thomas Wright, and he was the very first to postulate that our galaxy, or the universe, is actually a flat layer of stars. This is his idea, this picture that you see on the screen, for the structure of the Milky Way, for the structure of the universe. And this thinking was led due to that milky band that we see across the night sky, the fact that the light is concentrated in a flat area rather than being uniform across the sky. And by looking at, you know, the, the sort of, well, there's more stars in this area, there's less stars in this area, he realised that our sun, our star, was not in the middle of this slab. And he also considered that, hmm, all these like nebulae, these fuzzy blobs, these fuzzy clouds in the night sky that people have been finding, maybe they lie outside the Milky Way. Maybe the Milky Way is not the universe, but there's more beyond. But that's about as far as Thomas Wright could go. There's not so much heavy maths and science involved here, but thinking. And talking of thinkers, his contemporary, Immanuel Kant, was absolutely inspired by Thomas Wright. And he agreed, and he thought, hmm, maybe some of these spiral nebulae, these spiral fuzzy blobs that people have been cataloging and identifying in the night sky, maybe they are galaxies, maybe they are island universes in their own right. Not as far as we get there. Charles Messier was another who helped kind of thinking leap forward with considering island universes and galaxies. Charles Messier, comet hunter by trade, inadvertently made the best catalogue for amateur astronomers, Messier catalogue, fuzzy blobs that he wanted to avoid because they were not comets. He became the first to catalogue galaxies as spiral nebulae in a formal way. And of course, many others followed in his suit. Notably, Caroline and William Herschel, always Caroline and William, because we know how much she assisted him in his work. And Caroline and William were the first to really try and do some science to figure out the shape of our galaxy, the shape of the universe, the shape of the Milky Way. And in order to do this, they, they made some, you know, fairly reasonable assumptions, because, you know, it's quite a task to try and figure out the, the shape of something that you're sat in the middle of. Right. So they assumed that the telescope could resolve all of the stars in the Milky Way. So whenever they pointed their telescope at a patch of the night sky, if there was a star there to be seen, they could see it. They assumed that our galaxy was the universe. There was nothing beyond its boundary. And I've just realized that Siri listening to me go away okay i found this on the web for assumed no <laughs> okay no go away i'm so sorry about this oh shoo shoo siri go away look at this phd in astronomy and i still can't even manage my laptop right how do you get siri to go away Go away. Uh, does anyone actually know how to make Siri go away? Because I've never had this happen to me before. Interesting question. <laughs> Siri, go away. Why don't you ask him to close, uh, Jenny? Siri, close. Oh, perfection. Thank you so much. Um, so they made some assumptions that their telescope could resolve all the stars in the Milky Way. So if there was a star to be seen inside the eyepiece of their telescope, they were going to see it. 
They assumed that the galaxy was the entire universe. There was nothing beyond its bounds. Uh, nothing, no other island universes. And they also made perhaps a questionable assumption that the stars in the night sky are reasonably evenly distributed. I mean, we know this not to be true because of the band of the Milky Way, but I guess they had to start somewhere, right? To figure out the shape of the universe, the shape of our galaxy, the shape of the Milky Way. And so what they did is they pointed the telescope at 680 locations uh, in the night sky and counted the number of stars they could see and then used this to make a map. And this is the map of the universe, the first ever attempt at mapping our galaxy. Now, I will be the first to admit it's not very good. It's not great. But there are some interesting features here. First of all, it is flat ish. It's flattened, right? It's longer or long one axis than another. And well, you also have some interesting structure. You can kind of see where there's extensive stars in one direction, a kind of significant amount less that's going on, more extensive here. Is that maybe pointing at some kind of spiral arm structure, something like this, where we've got an absence of stars and then an excess of stars, something like that. So yes, I will freely admit that it's not great but it is fascinating. One thing they did get right, this dot here, this is supposed to be the sun and it's not in the middle. So pretty good job there. When we get to the 19th century, things really start hotting up because we've got telescopes on enormous scales that can really start to see detail. And all of this confusion between thinking about the universe is the galaxy? Is there something beyond the galaxy and there's more to the universe? All of this confusion that we've been trying to dance our way through for the past few centuries really starts to come to a head. So the Earl of Ross, William Parsons, he built the biggest telescope that existed for decades, the Leviathan. And it was big enough that he could actually start mapping some detailed structure in the spiral nebulae that had been known about for centuries now. So this is his sketch of M51. And then on the right, we've got a picture from Hubble of M51. And I think the comparison is truly remarkable. The amount that he got right is seriously impressive. And as telescopes were getting more sophisticated, these spiral nebulae really started to draw astronomers in. They were like, there's something interesting going on here. Let's explore them and explore them in detail. But the key to unlocking these spiral, these spiral nebulae and understanding the universe, the galaxy, what the boundaries were, came with stars, of all things. And in particular, curious evolved stars called Cepheid variables. Now, Henrietta Swan Levin was an astronomer working in America. And she was trying to find Cepheid variable stars in what we now know to be a neighbouring galaxy of our own, the Small Magellanic Cloud, this picture of the Small Magellanic Cloud in the middle. Now, Cepheid variable stars um, have a very strange property and an extraordinarily useful one. And that is that their intrinsic brightness is linked to how long they take to dim and then brighten and dim again. And we didn't know about this amazing property until Henrietta Swan Levitt discovered it. And she is the key to unlocking island universes, to unlocking our galaxy, to unlocking the universe. Because she discovered this amazing property. And once you know the intrinsic brightness, so the true brightness of a star, then all of a sudden you have a very powerful distance measurement tool. Because if you know how bright a star should be and you compare it to how bright it appears in the night sky, well, it's the old adage of dimmer things further away. And that's exactly what Cepheid variable stars were used for as a distance measurement tool, because we could monitor and we still do it today, how long it takes them to brighten and dim and then brighten again, know how truly bright they are, how bright they appear, we can make that comparison and we know how far away these stars are. 
1919, Harlow Shapley, another American astronomer, he used cepid variable stars to measure the size of the Milky Way, the size of the universe at that point. And he came to a conclusion that a few other astronomers had over the years, that our sun was not at the centre. And around this time, Harlow Shapley's work, Henrietta Swan-Levitt's work, really got the imaginations of astronomers firing. And there was an awful lot of debate about the nature of galaxies, the nature of the universe, trying to nail down all of this confusion. And the question was, if these spiral nebulae, which we could study in detail now, were they swirling clouds of gas forming stars? Or were they island universes in their own right? Or put another way, is the Milky Way the universe? Or is it just another galaxy? Is it just another spiral nebulae? So the two kind of drivers behind this debate, and it was a friendly debate, you know, is this astronomers, you know, they're, they're not picking fights with each other. Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis. And Shapley, who had done work on figuring out the size of the Milky Way, uh, figuring out that sun was not at the centre. He was of the opinion that these spiral nebulae were small, they were part of the Milky Way, the entire Milky Way was the universe, there was nothing beyond it. And that was because he'd worked out that if something like the Andromeda Nebula was going to be outside of our galaxy, well, it would have to be something like 10 million light years away, which seemed an impossible number at the time. Now, on the other side of this was Heber Curtis. And he'd noticed some curious things about some of these spiral nebulae that astronomers had been cataloging. And in particular, he'd noticed that many of them had dark dust lanes, just like we see in the Milky Way with that beautiful spill of light across the sky. And he also noticed that the number of novae, so new stars, in the so-called Andromeda Nebula, was similar to the amount that was witnessed in the Milky Way in our universe. Now, doesn't it seem curious that one tiny patch of the Milky Way would have the same amount of novae as the rest of it? Doesn't seem right. It seems more sensible that these spiral nebulae are island universes in their own right. But, how to find the answer? Well, the answer didn't come from either of them. It actually came from Edwin Hubble, who was using Henrietta Swan-Levitt's Cepheid variable stars to measure the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. And his number that he came up with was about a million light years. Not a bad estimate. Real answer is about two and a half million light years. So he really wasn't that far out. And no matter which camp you fell in at the time, it was the end of the road for the Milky Way is the entire universe debate because it was inconceivable. They knew that the Milky Way was not a million light years across. The million light years sunk the deal. The Andromeda Nebula was not a nebula. It was an island universe in its own right, living far, far outside of even the widest bounds of the Milky Way at that point. And this is where our branch of extragalactic astronomy and island universes begins. So what are these island universes? Well, we categorize them at first based on their visual appearance or their morphology. We've got spirals, ellipticals, irregulars, and encompassing all of these are miniature versions of all of them dwarfs. And Edwin Hubble was one of the first to kind of try and put these postage stamps into boxes. It's human nature, we like to categorise things. This is his original classification scheme. It's very important to note that this is not an evolutionary path at all. It was assumed at the time because of the way he decided to draw the diagram, that galaxies went from elliptical up into spirals, but he never ever intended this to be the case. So we've talked about 
these island universes. And we know that there are different names for them, spirals and ellipticals. But I haven't actually said what a galaxy is, what an island universe is. So in the shorter sentence, really, for trying to describe what a galaxy is, galaxies are gravitationally bound collections of gas and dust and stars all swirling around a, a centre of mass, which is very nearly always a supermassive black hole. They sit in wells of invisible dark matter, which we're going to completely ignore for this talk because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Now, elliptical galaxies are the most massive and the smallest galaxies in the universe. And they're made of ancient stars. That's why they kind of look yellowy, because they're no longer actively forming stars. The ones that are surviving in them are the older ones, the smaller stars, lower mass stars. Elliptical galaxies are denser in the middle and then they fade outwards towards their edges. They can be round like footballs. They can be more rugby ball shaped, but their structure is supported by the random motions of stars within them. They're all moving kamikazically in all different directions. And that's what keeps them round. They are often called red and dead because of their reddish colours. You know, they're more towards the yellow end and dead because they lack significant amounts of gas and dust to produce new generations of stars. We think that they're often formed from mergers during the merger processes, which are very violent eats up all of the remaining gas in the two colliding galaxies, or it can get thrown out during the merger as well, leaving them to become dead. But we think that all of them have supermassive black holes at their hearts. Now, spirals, spirals are the pretty boys of extragalactic astronomy. Everyone loves a spiral galaxy, named so because of their twisted arm structure. They're flat and thin, with a central bulge. Now, Sir Patrick Moore's analogy for spiral galaxies is always like two fried eggs clapped back to back, which is which is pretty good, except for the relative dimensions of a spiral galaxy. The relative dimension of a spiral galaxy is more akin to a CD or a DVD. They are extraordinarily flat and thin. Much like the ellipticals, we think nearly all of them have supermassive black hole at their hearts and spirals are rich in gas. So 10% of their mass can be in the form of gas, which means that they're actively forming stars. So you can see how their bulges are kind of yellowy like the ellipticals. There's not much star formation going on in the center there. But in their spiral arms, you can see this distinct blue color. And that's because their light is dominated by massive, hot, very young stars, which gives them that wonderful color. They're full of dust lanes as well, indicating active, ongoing and recent star formation. There's lots of different types of spiral galaxies. You can have ones which are barred, like this top left image. You can have ones without a bar. You can have grand design spirals, like M51 here, where the spiral arms are really well defined. You can have ones which are fluffy, so in the top right here, known as flocculent. Lenticular galaxies, they sit somewhere in between. They're a bit like ellipticals, they're a bit like spirals, but they don't fit into either camp because they can have a disc shape, but no spiral arms. Maybe they got some dust lanes, which you don't see with an elliptical, but they're severely lacking in gas, which means that they're not really actively forming stars anymore, just like the ellipticals. And actually, we can confuse lenticulars for elliptical galaxies quite often because face on, the two can look the same. Their formation is hotly debated. Are they fading spiral galaxies? We don't know, but lenticulars tend to be extraordinarily bright, even brighter than spirals. So mm, who knows? Have they had their gas stripped in some way? Maybe a passing galaxy ripped the gas out of them. Are they the result of mergers? Nobody really knows. They're a hot mystery. Irregulars are a kind of catch-all term for anything that's not an elliptical, not spiral, not a lenticular. They're the weird looking galaxies. They're typically small to medium in size compared to the others. They're often gas and dust rich and they're very susceptible to environmental effects because quite often they're interacting galaxies, merging galaxies or ones that have been recently disturbed. Small Magellanic Cloud, is an example of an irregular galaxy. The antenna galaxies, which are merging galaxies, are another wonderful example. 
dwarfs, well, you can get basically a dwarf version of any type of galaxy. The dwarf bit just meaning that it's small. These are extraordinarily difficult to find because they are small, they are low mass, they don't contain many stars, that makes them dim. We often find them as the satellite galaxies for others. And, you know, you can get dwarf spirals, dwarf ellipticals, dwarf irregulars, whatever you like to think of. And these are the most numerous galaxies in the universe, for sure. We just don't have that many of them in our catalogues because they are so hard to find. Compared to Hubble's day, our modern day tuning for where we're classifying galaxies by the way they look, looks quite different. This is an example of a modern day tuning fork. You can see we've got many more different types of ellipticals and spirals, even intermediate spirals, something that Hubble didn't have before. Barred spirals is more than just a three that he had. And of course, we've added in the irregulars, the strange galaxies that don't fit into any of these. But the problem with morphology, when we're trying to understand these island universes, so morphology is really subjective because what I say is an elliptical galaxy. You might go, now nah, that's an lenticular for sure. So we need something that's a little bit more sciencey, right? Now, even by eye, when we were looking at those photographs of galaxies, we can see the galaxies have different colors. The ellipticals were more yellow, the spirals were more blue. Now in astronomy, color has a very specific meaning is the difference in magnitude for a galaxy when calculated at two different wavelengths. So essentially you look at it maybe with a blue filter and a red filter, you see how the brightness changes, subtract the two, it gives you a number, that is your colour. And so what we can do is we can make a plot of the colour of different galaxies, which we've got on the y-axis, compared to how bright they are, which we've got down on the x-axis. And something very interesting emerges. We can see here in this density plot, so these are contours, just like uh, on maps for elevation, more contours equals denser. And we can see that we've got two blobs. It's quite interesting. We've got a red sequence. It's kind of a line going on here, right, in the density. So there's lots and lots of redder galaxies. That's those ellipticals. And then we've got what we call a blue cloud. So there's like a more diffuse, smudgy collection of bluer galaxies. Must be those spirals. But isn't it interesting that there's not much in between? Not a lot going on in the middle. So that indicates that whether you go from ellipticals to spirals or spirals to ellipticals, whatever happens, happens quite quickly because there's not many galaxies living in this place in the snapshot of the universe that we get to access. Or is it? Because if we look in the infrared, so instead of using light that we can't see with our eyes, quite a different story emerges. So here again, we have our red sequence and here again, we have our blue cloud. And this is using light that we can see with our eyes there's our valley in between the two. We've copied that across to the right here with the contours. That's what they're representing. And in the infrared data, which are the blues and the greens and the yellows, that valley's getting filled in. Isn't that interesting? So is this dichotomy, this difference that we see in the galaxy population, just a selection effect, because we're not looking at them all. Probably dive into this, shouldn't we? So now we're gonna take a quick detour into the infrared. Now the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum is light that we can't see. It exists beyond the red end of the rainbow. And it is extraordinarily important, it turns out, for understanding galaxies. And if we only study galaxies with the light that we can see with our eyes, it is truly like trying to understand the whole of planet Earth. But when you have an orange segment slice, which is only one and a half kilometers wide, because that's all we could see. 
the rest of the light of the universe is hidden to our eyes. The rest of Earth would be hidden to our eyes. So that's why we need to take a dive beyond what we can see. Infrared astronomy, while well, infrared light, like the very best things in science, was discovered quite by accident by this guy, Sir William Herschel, because finding galaxies and discovering a planet was not quite enough for him. He also had to find something invisible. And William Herschel in 1800 was doing an experiment where he was using prism to split up sunlight into a rainbow. And that's because there was some thinking at the time, it was like, oh, maybe like the different colours of the rainbow or different temperatures, you know, because we didn't know anything this time. So people were just trying any sort of scientific investigation that they could think of. And so he wanted to investigate this possible colour relation, temperature relation in the rainbow. But like any good scientist, he knew that if there was going to be some kind of temperature gradient in the rainbow, he would have to put thermometers at either end of the rainbow, just in case there was a temperature gradient in the room, and then he could factor that out. But to his surprise, when he was looking at his thermometers, measuring the temperature of the different colours, the highest temperature was not in the rainbow. It was beyond the rainbow, past the red end. William Herschel had discovered something invisible heating his thermometer. What he discovered was infrared light or heat energy. That's one way to think about it. And if you want to do this experiment, you can quite easily. Um, you can get everything online, just a small prism, some cheap thermometers, and hopefully you can just see that this thermometer just past the red end of the rainbow is registering the highest temperature. So if you want to discover infrared light for yourself, go for it. Now, in terms of using infrared light for astronomy, well, that started really slowly. We had to look at the moon. We had to look at the sun. But the problem was we couldn't really do it until the 50s and the 60s because we had to get above the atmosphere. That's because there's lots of water vapour in our atmosphere. It absorbs infrared light from and blocks it out from reaching our instruments. Additionally, you need to cool your instruments to detect infrared light. You're detecting heat energy. Don't cool your instruments. All they're going to detect is their own heat. And that technology, again, did not come on until the 1950s and 60s. We had um, lots of balloon experiments and so on like that. We had our first infrared space telescope in the 1980s. And then in more recent times, we've had things like SOFIA, which has just been retired. It was a telescope on a plane. We've got the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. We've got the UK Infrared Telescope, it's also in Hawaii, I believe. Uh, Spitzer, we've had Herschel, we've had Wise, and of course, the James Webb Space Telescope very recently. So infrared astronomy has done really well in the past few years. And when we're looking in the infrared or in the submillimeter, that's what it's sometimes called, we're looking at heat energy. So we're studying cool things, which sounds really, really counterintuitive. But it's where cooler things emit most of their light is at these longer wavelengths, because we're looking at lower energy systems. And typically, when we're looking in the infrared, we're actually looking at something called cosmic dust. Cosmic dust is the reason that you and I exist, the reason that the rocky planet that we live on exists. And it's everywhere. So we're very familiar with Saturn's rings, those beautiful icy structures. But did you know that Saturn also has an enormous donut of dust extending far, far beyond those icy rings that we're familiar with, which I've got a picture of on the right hand side? That tiny dot in the middle is Saturn with its icy rings. This donut is its giant dusty ring. Even Jupiter has a secret ring system, a secret dusty ring system. This is a recent James Webb Space Telescope image of that dusty ring system. You can't see it in the visible light, but it pops into almost beautiful technicolor when we have a look in the infrared. And cosmic dust are these tiny solid grains. There's a picture of a dust grain here. 
Uh, they're made of things like carbon and oxygen and other, other heavy elements. Much, much smaller than a grain of sand, much, much smaller than the width of a human hair. And typically when we're looking in the infrared, we're often looking at things to do with dust grains, especially when it comes to galaxies. Now, cosmic dust comes from the death of stars. It's produced by massive stars when they die in supernova explosions, and it's produced by small stars like the sun as they're dying and they puff off their outer layers, which are enriched in carbon and oxygen. And these layers cool and condense and can form dust grains. So this is a visible light picture in the middle here of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant in the light that we can see with our eyes. We turn to it in the infrared and suddenly the whole thing glows brightly. All of this is light from cosmic dust produced in the supernova explosion and then swept up as the supernova explosion has interacted with the stuff between the stars, that interstellar medium, the gas, which is laced with cosmic dust. And on the right, we've got a picture of Betelgeuse, which is uh, the shoulder of Orion, the left shoulder as you're looking on the sky of Orion, um, which caused us all those problems a couple of years ago when we thought it was going like, to disappear. And uh, you can see here that there are some shells surrounding Betelgeuse. And this is layers of material and rich material that the star has been puffing off as it's been dying. And as the materials moved away from the star, it's cooled and condensed and formed cosmic dust grains, which we can then see in the infrared. So cosmic dust grains are everywhere. They pervade the stuff between the stars, the interstellar medium, like smoke particles. Annoying for optical astronomers, because it obscures optical light, it absorbs optical light, and then re-radiates it deep into the infrared. So looking in the infrared, we get a completely different picture of the universe. On the left are the famous pillars of creation as Hubble sees, and on the right is the James Webb Space Telescope view. Suddenly we can reveal processes that are happening in galaxies that we can't see before. We can see countless newborn stars. We can see stars at the very earliest stages of their formation. Here we've got some pictures of the plane of our galaxy. So starting with optical at the bottom and then moving to longer and longer infrared wavelengths. Now at near infrared wavelengths, short infrared wavelengths, closer to the red end of the rainbow, we can kind of peer through the cosmic dust. And that is because you can almost think about it like an adult or a child in a ball pit. Now, it's a weird analogy, but bear with me. Now, the shorter wavelength optical light, which is the child with its little stubby legs, gets into the ball pit, which is our cosmic dust particles. And that child is struggling to get through. It cannot work its way through the dust. It can't work its way through the balls. It's ricocheting off them left, right, and center. But the adults with the long legs can wade through that ball pit, can wade through the cosmic dust, no problem at all, make its way through out to the other side. That's what's happening within the shorter wavelength infrared light here, the more energetic infrared wavelength light. But as then we go to longer and longer infrared wavelengths, we get the heat of the dust itself. We're studying objects that are minus 250 degrees Celsius and such cold objects, they glow brightest at these longer infrared seven millimeter wavelengths. So hopefully you can see in this image as we're moving from optical through to the infrared, we're peering first through the dust in our galaxy, giving us a completely different view. And then suddenly we start seeing the emission from dust and again at longer wavelengths. There are some galaxies that are so full of this amazing cosmic dust that we can't see them in the optical. So here we're progressing on the right hand side to longer and longer wavelengths in these boxes focusing on this pink circles galaxy in the middle. There is no galaxy at short wavelengths. The dust is in the way. There is no galaxy here either. It's only when we get to long infrared wavelengths that suddenly 
these galaxies, which we are missing in the visible, pop into view. So this really highlights that we cannot understand galaxies unless we look at them in the infrared. One of my favorite facts about the infrared universe is that half the starlight that has ever been emitted in the history of the universe has been absorbed by these curious cosmic dust grains and then re-radiated deep into the infrared. So if we don't look at these wavelengths, we are literally missing out on half of the universe. And a beautiful illustration of this is our very famous friend, the constellation of Orion. And this is a visible light picture, something that we might be quite familiar with. But if we have a look in the infrared, the picture changes completely. Suddenly we're seeing the emission from the dust at long infrared wavelengths. We're seeing it glow, we're revealing it. All of this cosmic dust entwined and mixed up with gas in galaxies, revealing an astonishingly different picture. It has a really disproportionate effect on the way we view the universe because only a tiny fraction of a galaxy's mass, far less than 1%, is in the form of cosmic dust grains. And yet it absorbs half of the starlight and it hides that population of galaxies that we saw in the Green Valley. Now we care about cosmic dust because it is the building blocks of planets like Earth. It tells us about previous generations of stars because of course dust comes from their deaths. And it can tell us what sort of stars are forming. All of it is hidden and encoded in this information. So in the pictures here, we've got our friend, the Andromeda galaxy in the visible, deep in the infrared. And I'm hoping that you can just see the dark dust lanes when you look at them in the infrared are glowing brightly. So we can see how we're studying completely obscured parts of a galaxy in the optical when we have a look in the infrared. This is a patch of the night sky that was first imaged using the Herschel Space Telescope. And you can see that it's full of dots. So the Herschel Space Telescope was a deep infrared submillimeter space telescope and picks up all these dots. And you might think that all of these tiny dots our stars would be a reasonable assumption. So when I say tiny dots, I'm not just talking about the bright spots that we've got in the middle here. I'm talking about all these little ones, which are in the background as well. All of these tiny little dots that you can see. Well, all of these tiny little dots, not a single one of them is a star. Every single one is a distant galaxy in some of the remotest parts of the universe completely hidden away from us because of all this mysterious cosmic dust inside them. It is only when we look in the infrared that suddenly these galaxies pop into view. Isn't that extraordinary? That every dot is a galaxy. Yeah, it blows my mind too. Now, the other important reason that we need to study galaxies in the infrared is because of something called cosmological redshift often attributed to Hubble. Actually, he kind of just put together the work of a lot of other people, brought it all to a head. Now, cosmological redshift is a very curious phenomenon. And I'm going to play you a video. And I've been told before in this video, ah, Jen, no, you've got a flat Earth in this video. But this is a problem when you try and represent 2D, 3D geometry on a 2D plane. So yes, technically it's a flat Earth. But what's a girl to do? Now. We live in a strange universe. Our universe is expanding. And light is good, but it is not immune to this expanding universe. Because although light is quick, it's the quickest thing in the universe, it doesn't travel infinitely fast. It has a finite speed. And so just as it takes time for us to walk to the shops, it takes light time to work its way through the universe and come towards us. And as light is working its way towards us, at breakneck speed from the distant universe. It is traveling through an expanding universe. It's getting stretched too. And that means that its wavelength is getting stretched. Its wavelength is increasing. 
and light that was perhaps once visible to us in the optical is actually no longer visible to us. So wave anchor has been stretched and it is now deep, deep, deep into the infrared. As you can see in this video, so we've got our expanding universe, our galaxy that's emitting blue starlight to begin with. As the universe is expanding and that light is moving towards us, it gets stretched and stretched and stretched and ends up deep, deep into the red, into the infrared, sorry. This is just another depiction of this, just in case it's a little bit clearer in picture form instead of video. So we've got starlight, once emitted by galaxies in light that we could see. It travels through an expanding, stretching universe. It's wavelength increasing, moving from our sight deep into the infrared. Which means that we've got two ways we're losing galaxies in the universe. Number one, they contain so much dust that it's blocking them out from view. And then number two, they're so far away that they, they're only existing in the infrared now. Which is why it's so important to look beyond what we can see. One of the best illustrations of this is with the James Webb Space Telescope alignment evaluation image. I highly recommend after this, you go online, download this, drop it into Photoshop or something and play around with the brightness levels. Now, this was never meant to be a science image. It was just to make sure that that star was nice and pin sharp so that the telescope was in focus. But you crank up the background on this image to make it bright and bam! Accidentally, we are discovering some of the earliest galaxies that exist in our universe. It's down the bottom here, just past the spike. Look at this guy. Look at that. That is a spiral galaxy. Just accidentally popping in the background of a star image. Look at it. Look at that spiral arm. And then this is probably an edge-on spiral. Look, it's definitely brighter in what could be the middle. And then fading outwards towards the edge, but in a distinctly sharp needle pattern, right? You can have a look down in the bottom left. And I'm not being funny. But does this not look like M51? Look at that. Look at that. That has to be some sort of spiral arm that's sticking up there. Surely. Surely it has to be. All of these are galaxies previously undiscovered. Apart from about half a dozen, I think, of the brightest. So, for example, this guy here, this guy here. These guys we definitely didn't know about before. Look what's, go oh, what's going on with these. Look, this is all distorted and warped. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. We've got interacting galaxies. Who knows? But the most exciting galaxies in this image are not the ones that we can see some beautiful spiral arms that we can on this guy down here. It's all these faint blobs. These tiny little specks, just about visible. These are the most distant ones. These are the ones that have been traveling, their light's been traveling through the universe for so long. They are only the faintest specks in our infrared images, but these are the ones that we are most interested to learn about, the very first galaxies, the very first stars. So we can't just look in the infrared, as cool as the infrared universe is, right? Our best bet in understanding galaxies is actually taking all of the awesome infraredness and all of the cosmic dust information that we've got and combining it with what we can see with our eyes, with the starlight, with the visible light that we're seeing from stars. So here we have some, we've had a look at a galaxy, the black markers, we've had a look at a galaxy, a different wavelengths of light that we can pretty much see with our eyes, maybe a little bit beyond the blue end, maybe a little bit beyond the red end. But this is corresponding largely to what we can see basically the stars in the galaxy. We can do the same with the dust and the infrared light. So we've had a look at a few different wavelengths in the infrared, light we can't see with our eyes. And so we're looking at the starlight that has been absorbed, re radiated by the dust. Pretty good idea, because as we can see here, 50% of the light comes from stars, 50% of the light comes from the dust. And so we can take all of this light 
from the visible and the invisible universe. And then we fit models. That's what these lines are that you see going through the data points. And within these models, we put information like the mass of a galaxy, how quickly they're forming stars, the sort of dust that they've got inside them, the sort of heavy element content that they've got within them. And the best fit model that fits our data, that then tells us what we think that galaxy is like. We can find the stellar mass. We can find how quickly these galaxies are forming stars. Because, you know, that's the job of a galaxy, right? Convert gas into stars, surely. So then we've got maybe something tangible that we can work with. So before we took our detour into the infrared, this is where we were. We were trying to find ways to understand galaxies. We talked about morphology, the way they look. We then talked about their colour. And we had this curious red sequence and blue cloud, which suddenly disappears when we look in the infrared. But now that we've understood we can look at galaxies in the infrared, we can find the missing starlight. We can truly get a full picture of what's going on. We can get galaxy properties out using our models like stellar mass and star formation rate. Let's see if we can use those properties of galaxies to understand this diversity in the galaxy population that we're seeing. Why do galaxies look different? Why are there different galaxies? So what we can do is we can take those properties, such as stellar mass, which we've got on the x-axis. All you need to know is that we're increasing stellar mass as long as we go along the x-axis. And we can take star formation rate, and we're increasing star formation rate as we go up the y-axis. So you're more actively forming stars the higher you're sitting up here. Something very interesting emerges. There's a correlation between stellar mass and star formation rate. Look at this. We've got, we could draw a line through that. We've got an extraordinarily dense part of this plot where all of our galaxies are sitting. So as you're a more massive galaxy, you seem to be better at forming stars. You're forming stars more ferociously. And the fact that this part of the, the plot is so dense tells us that actually, this is where galaxies spend most of their lives. They're all living here. All of the galaxies that we're looking at are all living in this same space. And we've got a reasonable dense bit that's at high stellar masses, but not doing a lot in terms of star formation rate. We've got this kind of blob. Now, massive galaxies that aren't doing a lot, to me, sounds like elliptical galaxies. Our red and dead galaxies that are full of stars, but they're done, they're in their retirement years. They're not doing too much anymore. And because we have a low scatter, so this is quite a tight relation, it tells us that for most galaxies, they're all doing the same thing. Hmm. Interesting. So the processes that are driving star formation in galaxies, pretty much the same, no matter the size of your galaxy. So then what we can do is we can take this one step further and think, well, okay, that's good for galaxies in the nearby universe. But what about through time? Because, of course, when we look out into the night sky and we look out into the universe, because of the finite speed of light, things that are further away, we're actually looking back in time. So if it's true that the same processes are happening for galaxies, no matter their size in the local universe, does this apply throughout time as well? So we can do that. This is exactly the same plot as we just saw. It's got stellar mass on the bottom and we've got star formation rate going up the y-axis. Only this time we're going back through time. So you've got the nearby universe in purple and then we're slowly working our way back through time. The red shifts are labelled on this plot. Red shifts are not very helpful. So I've got a little key down the bottom which translates it into, you know, sensible numbers of actual time. So we're going back through most of the history of the universe here with red shift. And what we see is this line that we could draw on the previous plot 
it exists in the nearby universe. And actually, as we go all the way back through nearly 8 billion years of history. Which means that throughout time, galaxies have been doing the same thing they've always done. They've made stars in exactly the same way. Ah, interesting. But as we go back through time, we're going to higher and higher redshifts, and we're going to the earlier parts of the universe. We're going to higher and higher star formation rates. Galaxies billions of years ago were really ferociously forming stars. Man, right? We think we're forming stars in the universe today. It had nothing on the universe eight billion years ago. And also, this slope disappears when we get to the most massive galaxies, the really giant ones. So for the most massive galaxies, they're actually pretty pants at forming stars compared to their much smaller brethren. So it seems that you get to a point and something stops you forming stars as effectively. Strange. If we go further back again, almost to the very beginning, as far back as we can get, we see something very interesting. So here we've got time. So we're going between time on the x-axis and then star formation rate again on the right on the y-axis. We go all the way back. And we actually see that galaxies were most efficient at forming stars 10 billion years ago. We live in a dying universe. Galaxies are rubbish at forming stars these days compared to 10 billion years ago. But why? Why is that? So to understand this, we have to look at the fuel for star formation and the product of star formation, which is the cosmic dust, which is that infrared light. Now, traditionally, we always used to trace gas using carbon monoxide. Very difficult to do that in the early universe because telescopes are expensive. But dust, dust we can easily trace back. Look at those James Webb Space Telescope pictures we looked at. We accidentally found a bunch of new galaxies stretching back through the history of the universe. We weren't even trying. So that dust is intermingled with the gas in galaxies. We can use that as a tracer and we can really probe what's going on in galaxies. What is driving star formation? What is driving the different types of galaxies that we see? Why do we see these different types of galaxies? Why are there spirals? Why are there ellipticals? And why are they all dying in the nearby universe? This is what we're trying to answer now. This is where we stand 100 years ago after galaxies were discovered. We know there are different types. We know that they have different masses. We know that they form stars at different rates. But why? Why are they forming stars at different rates? Don't know. Why are they different types? We still don't know. We're trying to figure that out. Is it something to do with gas? Is it something to do with them interacting with each other? Is it something to do with their environment? And that is where we stand on Island Universes today. So thank you very much all for listening. And I hope that you have been left with as many questions as extragalactic astronomers are facing today. Thank you, yeah. Jenny. Before we move on to, to questions, can we thank Jenny for a talk? I love getting the historical background to the science. It puts it all on the context very nicely as well. So it's really <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, we do have questions. Uh, Peter, do you want to um, go through the ones on Zoom? Yeah, we have uh, Nigel. Are you there? You are there. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. Would you like to ask your question? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Jenny, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating and, and a, a wonderfully rounded talk. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, you. What, what I was most interested in. Um, the, the the gas and dust that that stars are formed of mm. um uh, within galaxies is that being drawn in uh from the intergalactic space between galaxies uh i, I mean where's where, or how do 
galaxies get that raw material, get that that fuel? Where, where does it come from? What a question indeed. Where does it come from? That is a really hot topic of research at the minute because there's there's one party which is very much like, oh no, like galaxies are closed systems, you know, they what they might do is eject a little bit of gas, but then it stays gravitationally attached and it'll sort of rain back down and fall back into the galaxy. That's one camp. Another camp thinks that, yes, it's collect all connected to the intergalactic medium, that somehow superheated gas between galaxies is dragged in. It, it can cool down, it can be pulled in and adds to galaxies over time. This then changes the equation for elliptical galaxies because then do they have an opportunity at some point to get more gas and start forming stars again? So a lot of the gas um, that is in spiral galaxies that we see now is gas that was sort of intrinsically part of the galaxy um, when they were formed. Um, but again, why why some galaxies burn through their material so quickly and, and why some are, you know, actively forming stars today? Big question. We're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, personally, I think I'm more along the lines of, yes, with intergalactic medium, you know, it, it, there's there's all sorts of connections going on there. Um, but, yeah, again, we really don't know when it comes to galaxies. We we don't understand them very well at all. So yeah, great question. Thank you very much. Hmm. Uh, there aren't any other questions except for me. And that is, I was just wondering if there's any evidence in all that analysis of recycling. Whether you know galaxies get recycled into each other or so there's definitely recycling of gas in galaxies. Um because we see that the material that stars are formed from today is enriched in material from previous generations of stars. So when these stars die, they're not only um, producing cosmic dust as they're dying, but the way they're producing that cosmic dust is heavier elements, which can then cool and condense and form the grains. But it's not all of those heavier elements going to making dust. Some of it just exists in, in the gas. And so then when stars form, we can look at the amount of heavier elements that are in these stars and realize that it's more than what we saw we would see in the beginning of the universe. So there is sort of internal recycling with galaxies in that um, previous generation, material from previous generations of stars will make future generations of stars. Um, but yeah, so um, again, in terms of maybe material is sort of driven out by black holes and can that then rain back down onto the galaxy and stuff all of that is um, seriously active regions of investigation when it comes to galaxy evolution thank you uh over to will will i see there are quite a few uh, questions on youtube so do you want to pick out a couple <laughs> i'm going to take um excellent talk there uh, jennifer and there's been lots of uh, response um from uh, from YouTube with lo lots of viewers from all over the world, as Mark already mentioned. Um, it's been a few questions from Jeffrey Greenspan, but I'll just sort of um, try and grab two from them, starting with um, how is dust mass in the interstellar medium calculated, first of all? Ah, yes, good question. So um, again, it's part of those models that we can fit um, to our galaxies. So, um, so you can remember that plot that I showed where we had um, the, the data points where we looked at galaxies at different wavelengths. Um, and then we had all of those lines going through and it was like the two bumps um, and all of those different lines are, are models that could fit the data. Um, so just like we can get um, stellar mass out and we can get star formation rate out, and we can look at the metallicity, so the heavier elements that are existing in these galaxies. Again, another parameter that we can get out is dust mass. Um, there, there are other ways to do it, but this is the most common way to do it, is to fit these models. And in order to constrain the dust mass, it is absolutely vital to have those infrared measurements, um, because otherwise that part of the light, you can imagine the models, if you've got no data there at all, well, you can fit just about anything. You know, it can wobble around and you can have lots of dust, you can have no dust. So that's why it's absolutely vital to get those infrared measurements to constrain those models and get dust masses out. 
That's excellent. And then um, Jeffrey goes on to ask about um, in a, a given section of star forming cloud, what determines whether single stars of large mass form or multiple stars of lesser mass form? <gasps> what indeed? Yes, this this is again something that's ongoing. So we have something called um, the initial the initial mass function, which describes uh, the number of large stars, massive stars. Sorry, I should say massive stars that you get um, compared to you know the the number of small stars you get. And you know, generally, you will get fewer massive stars and then more smaller, uh, you know, less massive stars. But exactly how those ratios work out. We're not sure. And this is something that actually the James of Space Telescope scientists are looking at in the pillars of creation. They're really keen because now we've got this super high resolution data and we're sort of peering through the clouds and looking at all, th all through different layers of the clouds so we can really get a handle on the mass of the clouds that have formed stars, the newborn stars, and kind of do a number count and try and figure that out. Because when you get, you know, a really massive star forming, they have really powerful stellar winds and they can just drive material away. And so then there's nothing left to form more stars. But the question is, to what extent does that happen? Mm. That's what we're trying to figure out. Like you're asking all of the questions which are right at the cutting edge of research now. It's it's absolutely brilliant. And again, it ties into, you know, how, you know, with binary stars and triple star systems and, and how they form. And yeah, it's, it's we don't know much about the universe at all. And yet we understand so much of it. It's, it's a wonderful paradox. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's fantastic. And just um, a final question um, from someone else from AC. And I know um, you haven't wanted to talk about dark matter, but he's just sort of asking, does um, variations in dark matter composition um, sort of um, determine the rate of star formation? So um, really dark matter doesn't so much affect the um, small scale ongoings of a galaxy in the sense of um the because the stars are happening are forming on such a localized scale that the overall well of dark matter um isn't going to impact like the star formation that's going on there like the dark matter works on much much grander scales it's much like um the dark matter doesn't affect uh our solar system it is all kind of you know under under the influence of the sun and under under its own influence. So, dark matter itself is not impacting individual star formation. Um, however, uh, dark matter wells of dark matter will probably influence normal matter that's coming into a galaxy. So there is influence on that level, but not on like the localized scale of individual stars forming. But yeah, good question. Right. And just finally, I, I, I'm just always intrigued by the, the size. And as far as you can, you can see, I'd just like to ask, looking at it was great, um, the animations and stuff that you, you, you gave of the infrared about um, galaxies, just, you know, just you, the, the further you look, the more you can see. But yeah. is there going to be a limit to effectively that you can see? And what's your feelings about what's beyond that? I mean, yeah. When when um, astronomers like lots of the guys in society spend hours with their telescopes to try and get really detailed image, Im images of galaxies and stuff that really far away, are you going to need to use something like James Webb and have it literally looking at the same area for tens of hours, days, yeah. to try yeah. and drag these things out for the deepest, deepest things you can get? Yeah, and exactly. So just like we had the Hubble ultra deep field, we're going to have the James Webb Space Telescope ultra deep field, only because the, the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope, it can see further than the Hubble because it's seeing that light that's been cosmologically redshifted. It is seeing, it can see the light from you know, very, very dusty galaxies, but really it's it's the ones that have been cosmologically redshifted out of the visible into that infrared and yeah it'll be staring for the equivalent of days if not weeks to tease those out so we'll be able to see back to the first light 
of the very first stars. That's one of the goals of the James Webb Space Telescope. And when that exactly is, is an open question. It's one of the questions that will be answered is when those first stars formed, when those first galaxies formed. And then, you know, what were they like? You know, what did the first galaxies look like? Were they immediately starting to form structure? Were they like globular clusters? Were they irregular galaxies? Like, were they all very quickly colliding? We don't know because we've never been able to access this part of the universe before. The James Webb Space Telescope is literally going to see further than any telescope has before. And so with it, we'll be able to see back two, 300 million years after the Big Bang, something like that. And then we've seen back further than that with um, the cosmic microwave background. Um, so that is the very furthest back that we can go. So that's about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But of course, this is not um, the light from stars and galaxies. That limit will be found by the James Webb Space Telescope. So, um, yeah, and we can't go beyond the cosmic microwave background. That is the first light in the universe. Um, because prior to that, the universe was just a hot soup of of particles ricocheting off each other. And it was only when the universe cooled down enough that atoms could form and photons could restream through the universe. That's what the CMB is. But of course, cosmologically redshifted to an extent that it goes even beyond the infrared into the millimeter part of the electromagnetic spectrum bordering on radio waves. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we could carry on digging uh, around in that for a, a long time, but I think we'll, f we'll finish there. So can we thank Jenny again for that amazing talk? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Great. Very thank excellent you. questions. Like seriously good ones. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Okay. That is um, the final uh, talk of um, 2022. Uh, it's a great one to finish on. Um, we will be back on the 6th of January uh, with... Um, Rhea Urban tells us about how to um, save the sky because we still want to be able to dig deeper into the universe. Near the satellites are going to block it. We're going to struggle with that. So um, let's hope we can do something about that. So see you on the 6th of January. Um, enjoy your Christmas holidays. Um, have a happy new year when it comes. And thank you for joining us. And hope to see you again next.